I worked with Joe uh, for many years at the Computer Science Lab. Both he was a colleague and he was a good friend of mine um, for many years. Right? So I just want to talk a little bit about working with Joe. Um, let's see, we've got things. Yes. Okay, yeah. That Francesco basically said that, yes, yes. I just want to make one little disclaimer, right? Um, these are just trying to put together some patterns working together with Joe after the fact, right? And these are our words, so if it's a disclaimer. If you don't agree with us, well, that's it. Um, so speaking for Joe quite, was quite difficult. He was a very strong-willed and strong opinionated person. So he had a lot of very strong ideas about what things should be like and what they should not be like, which we all experienced. But at the same time, he was also very open to argument. He wasn't locked in his ideas. If you took an argument with him and have discussion with him, he could change his ideas if he felt that he was wrong. So that, that, that happened. And that happened a lot when we were working inside the lab together. So that our work together was a lot of discussions, a lot of arguments, arguments, good arguments in this sense, arguments that led somewhere, not just destructive arguments for it. We could work out our ideas for it and work together to do these things. And again, you could, if you could convince him he was wrong, he would change his mind and agree with that. And there were, we had a lot of different ideas we were working on and different goals. And one of the ones we were working on, which Joe was very strong was, strong about was always write code, right? The proof of the pie is in the eating. If your code doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it's wrong, right? No matter how good your idea might feel, it's wrong, right? So programming, that was an activity to help us think about our ideas. And we were, we were very strong on that and he pushed it all the time. If he came up with a good idea, you would write code to show that it was a good idea. If the, your code didn't show it was a good idea, then it was a bad idea. And we did that progress a long time, the whole way we were pushing this. So all, everything that we're working on, everything was tested. Always write code to test it, always iterate. Work on your ideas, did how to fit in with what you before, what was bad about it, how would I want to change it, and the, the, the coding was always the final test when we're designing the system and building the system. Did it do what it was supposed to do? Yes or no? We worked with that a lot. And I mean, as I was saying before, there were a lot of discussions and arguments around this, what should be the right thing, but we tested everything as we went. Um, I don't know, this, this, had, this had actually some negative sides effects as well too for it. Because we had discussed these things for so long and argumented about them for so long, by the time we got them down into the code and into the working system, the ideas to show that they were correct, we felt they were pretty self-evident. Of course you would do like this. How could anyone not do it like this? Because we, we, it worked, right? Um, that, if I'm talk, we're not going to talk much about Alang here, but one of the things this resulted in, resulted in was that we never wrote down an Alang rationale, for example. Because why would you need one? Of course you do like this. This is how it's supposed to be done. And that meant that some people did not quite understand why things looked like they did. We knew, but they didn't. But again, always write, always code. Code was the end for it, always write code. This is how you work. Um, another thing he was very strong about, which we supported him in, was that when you're developing a system, try to find the right set of minimum primitives that do what you need, okay? Um, it's, Easy just to chuck in a new idea the whole time and a new feature and just keep adding new features as you go. And each one might be reasonable, but at the end you're going to end up with something very complex, difficult to understand and difficult to use. So the idea, the idea was, that what we were working on, what was pushing hard was, try and keep it down to a minimum. Try and find out the right ideas with which you could use to build everything else on top of it. You don't need many primitives if you get the right primitives, okay? And this is, we did a lot of work with this, thinking about what do I need, what do we need for doing this, we do we need this, 
can we do what we need here? Do we need something new or not, right? And this took a lot of effort to doing it, but it was well worth it in the, in the long run. Um, I can say, this is not simple. It, takes, it can sometimes take a lot of effort to work out what minimum set do we need to do things. But in the long run, it's a big win, uh, which we found this. Uh, this is not something we discovered, but other people have commented on as well. There is a very good quote by Dijkstra about this, where he talks about it saying it's very hard to do it. You need a lot of understanding to both to, to um, write, build these type of systems and to understand these type of systems and to use them, but, and also at the same time, it doesn't quite sell as well as complexity. But it does it. And this is something we work on a lot and we felt was very important. And he was pushing for it. And this, this went the whole way through what we were doing. So yeah, um, that's basic. I don't know if I was going to say anything more about do anything more about. No, I don't think so. These guys. This is the fun bit, right? Now you've heard me talk. The, the, these two guys are the fun bit. The, these are a couple of things that that Joe um, was very interested in working on and working with and taking part in after Ericsson. We left Ericsson there for it as well. So the next one slide. Yeah, there's another slide. Yes. Joe and Sam talking about the Sonic Pi. This is where it gets fun. So yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. we have uh, Sam. Yeah. So um, hi, I'm Sam. Um, uh, so I was uh, the first time I ever met Joe. Actually, was at, uh, at, at I think it was at Strange Loop, and uh, no, it was before that actually. Now the first time I talked was at Strange Loop. I get to the moment, but the first time I ever met him uh, was in Lithuania at a conference where I was being the DJ in an underground nightclub slash comedy center. And uh, which was cool. I was, if you're gonna have a conference, yeah, have, a, have the party in a nightclub way better than the conference venue. That's a lesson to be learned. Um, and, uh, uh, and if Joe was there, he was there at this, this particular time, uh, uh, it was very loud, obviously. And we were making the music and it was very loud. And there was gonna be a DJ afterwards who was gonna play proper DJ. Everyone was dancing and Joe went, can you turn this music down? It's far too loud. Like, that's the Joe Armstrong. Um, <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, Joe, but I can't, because this is a music venue, and, it, and you can go upstairs and have a chat if you want to. It's quiet upstairs. Uh, and that was my first ever <laughs> introduction to him. Um, and then we became friends. How did that work out? So I think that, <laughs> um, so that, that, was, that was fun. And then the next time I met him, uh, this, and this is later in Sweden, was at Strange Loop. And uh, I think at that point, he'd, he'd seen, seen the music things, and it sort of spurred his interest, because he was always interested, deeply interested in music, learning the piano, learning many different things to do with music. And uh, uh, he met me, and he said, this Sonic Pi sounds really interesting. H how do I communicate it to Erlang? Can I talk to it from Erlang? I said, of course. You just need to send a message on this particular port uh, to my machine, or if you run Sonic Pi on your local host, and this is the structure of that message. And he was like, brilliant. And then he went away, and like an hour later, he emailed me and said, I've got it working, it's great. And so that since then, we just spent time talking about how we could get our ideas together. And, and, it, and, it, and it was, what well, for me was beautiful was that, um, that, that the conversations we had were really, really, uh, uh, they, 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 they found a common place in, in language. And this is really just an extension of, of Robert's point about finding the primitives. Um, because my job at this point, and still is, was finding the primitives to explain music in a way that's both powerful for professional musicians and also simple enough to teach to 10-year-old children. So I was deeply trying my best to find ways to simplify the world I was in in such a way that I can go into schools. And also what I found interesting as well is that out of that, particularly with music, concurrency just, just fell out. You know, because what's more complicated? Right, the person playing the cymbals with their knees, mouth organ, you know, banjo, and singing at the same time, or having separate people doing each of those things. And so when I'm thinking about music, concurrency just fell out of that. And so I started thinking of these very simple primitives to explain concurrency with respect to music. And it turned out I built a really crappy, half-assed implementation of a very small portion of the beam you know, in Ruby. <laughs> Um, but what was really nice is because I'd really spent a lot of time 
finding those primitives, they were, they were great to talk to Joe with. And we were able to sit down together, and he would explain to me the basic primitives of Erlang, and I would be able to describe the basic primitives of Sonic Pi. And there was a lot of commonality. And that was really, really rich conversation uh, and a very beautiful thing. And, and so Joe was always really interested in exactly finding these primitives. And once we found the language which to communicate with, it was really, really, really nice, high bandwidth conversation. So really finding the languages you're working with is, it was a critical thing. But, but really, my, my, my main uh, memory from Joe really was his like fire hose of curiosity. Uh, so he was interested in the piano, but he's also buying these crazy digital musical instruments. This is Joe in his home. And it's like, Sam, look at this. I bought this thing. It's called Innovation Circuit. I, he didn't really understand it properly, but he was pressing all the buttons and trying it out and, and loving it. Can we hook this to the Sonic Pi? A, he, had, he, had a, he tweeted a photo, actually, from this visit where we took all my kit and we just sprawled it out over his living room. And we were just plugging it in and talking about it. And my memory, really, of Joe uh, that, that's, that's the strongest was the fact that, that he just kept emailing and emailing and emailing and emailing. And I, and I couldn't keep up. And at the time, I was, uh, I was really struggling with funding, and I was struggling with uh, 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 trying to figure out how to go forwards. And I, and I was like, Joe, Joe, this is really interesting. Can we just pause this for, just for a few months until, until I just sorted myself out? And by the time I sorted myself out, it'd gone. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a real tragedy in many ways. But the, the curiosity that he had that, that drove his, his insight, that, that made him ask so many questions. And not all those questions were good questions. You know, He just kept asking questions. But when we had uh, a discourse to have, it really took it to very interesting places. So his, his drive to ask questions is something I would really, really recommend everyone does. And, and I, I mean, I, when, I'm, when I meet different people, one of the things I find interesting is if the people are interesting. You know, do they have something interesting to say? Joe had many, many interesting things to say. But the next thing is, like, this is slightly rarer, is to find people who are interested, who want to know what you're going to say and listen to you. Joe did that in abundance. Obviously, he would give his opinions back straight away, but he would be, he would be very interested. And then the third thing I find when I meet very special people is not only are they interesting and interested, they're also really excited to find a common ground between you and them. And what is that subset, that, that, the cross-section of the Venn diagram between your interesting thoughts? And for us, it was music and code. And uh, he was capable of not just being interesting and interested, but of, of, of finding that common ground. There's something that's just more than him and more than me together. And we really explore that in great detail. And that, so for me, was a, 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 a fabulous memory of Joe. So I think that the advice really is this, is never, ever stop learning. And Joe never, ever did. And he, he surprised me with his, the, the level of his intensity of intellect all the way to his last days. And, and uh, so I really recommend that all of you do that. And when I go into schools and, and teach coding to kids, and I talk with the teachers, it's often the case that adults tend to turn their minds off far earlier than they ever should. And Joe never, ever turned his mind off. And that was my memory of Joe. Um, and I think now we're on to Tiddlywicky. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Um, indeed, so... <clears throat> A year or two after Joe um, came into Sam's life, uh, he arrived in mine. Um, I think it was just after he'd retired from, uh, from Ericsson. And we engaged in a long correspondence and did lots of work together. Partly the, um, his strategy, as he saw it, unlike Francesco's version, his, stra his version was that he would ask us to collaborate so that he'd get a year to work together preparing for the talk. And, uh, so we've been trying to <coughs> capture some of the things that seem to us distinctive about working with Joe. And I agree with everything that um, uh, Sam and Robert have said. Um, but there's one thing that I really liked about Joe was his, he was always looking for the um, root core, uh, for the fundamental principles governing things. And so uh, when he first encountered Tiddlywiki, instead of playing with it or reading the manuals, he re-implemented it in Erlang. Um, <laughs> very characteristic. And I've got a lovely message to say, oh, I've got this bit working. Didn't bother with that bit. Doesn't look like you need it. And as far as I know, he wrote about seven different versions over, over the years, all slightly different and all slightly different from mine. So that's partly that always be writing code. And to me, the, the thing about always be writing code is that I 
used to think that what I did was make things and that the result of programming was a nice, neat artifact that we can be proud of. But now I think the artifact, although important as much, what's really important is the change that happened to you in making that thing, um, if that makes sense. And Joe would uh, invoke the laws of physics in a way that I don't think I really necessarily understand the laws of physics well enough to invoke them. Um, but his, uh, his points about if you want to build fault-tolerant systems, you need duplicate, duplicate computers. And uh, his uh, points that I think um, well made last year about latency, meaning that we need to move computation to where it's needed. And then given the speed of light, that means we need a message passing system. So to Joe, kind of looking, at, looking out into the world at nature, he derived from that the actor model, not that, according to Robert, not that you were calling it the actor model at the time. Um, and he was fascinated by subtler natural laws like entropy. He often cited, okay, so always be coding. Joe, um, as Sam said, Joe died in the middle of our conversation, which was very, uh, you know, very shocking. So I responded to that, um, you know, the best way to deal with grief, write code. So I wrote code to extract all the email correspondence we'd done, turned it into an email, into a tiddlywiki, so that I could analyze it and work with it and so on. And uh, one of the things that Joe said, so he mentions entropy several times. I'm not even sure I really know what entropy is. Um, but uh, he says that uh, he, for a very long time, I've wanted an assistant that watches what I do and helps me. This is my ultimate goal. I want to reduce entropy. I want to discover similar tiddlers and merge them to reduce entropy. So what I think he's get, getting at here is it's easy to write notes to, you know, each time you have a thought, you write it down and you build a big amassment of notes. But that A, what actually happens is you end up rewriting the same note endlessly because you've forgotten what you did a year ago. Um, but Joe's way of seeing that in terms of entropy, uh, he, he also made the point that it's easier to, I think you said this, easier to take things out of a design than to add them. Um, oh, sorry, easier to add things to a design than to take them out. And so it's, uh, you know, the physical law, if I've got it right, is that entropy increases. Um, and uh, so our conversations ended up, Joe, I guess we haven't quite said this, Joe's um, could be ambitious, his idea of, what, where we should take TiddlyWiki was to make it be planetary scale using Erlang um, as the mechanism. And so uh, one of our uh, abiding long-term interests was to re-implement TiddlyWiki in Erlang with tiddlers being individual processes and transclusion being messages. Um, and I think then, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to move slides. Oh, so I was looking at the slides there. So everything I just said was supposed to be with that, but I'm sure you got the... Uh, uh, and the other one is, is subtle. This, this one, um, programmers care about efficiency. And in the name of efficiency, we do some terrible things. Um, like, who remembers DLLs? Um, and for me, the, the dark point was about 20 years ago, there was an article on the front page of the Telegraph that had to explain what a DLL was, you know, because of some kind of worm or something that had hit the news. Um, but to me, that journey from a programmer in 1983 saying we've got to save a few hundred kilobytes by having this shared file to then turning into something that's sufficiently disruptive that the Daily Telegraph should seek to inform their readers. So, so we, programmers love dependencies. It's a way to improve efficiency. Um, Joe's observation was that uh, there's something really special about having zero dependencies. Um, and you know, it's easy to see zero dependencies as just one less than one dependency, but it's completely transformatively different. So uh, TiddlyWiki being a self-contained uh, wiki, the original prototypes from 15 years ago still run today. Um, you know, there's no tool train or anything, it's just an HTML file that you can, uh, that you can view. Uh, and Joe was interested in lots of things a bit like so PDFs. Has, did anybody have Joe bending their ear about the PDF file format? Um, a, he loved it because uh, it embodied some of the, well, it embodied that principle of self-containedness, but it's also, uh, it's a, the way PDFs, you know, there's lots of little chunks within it. And there's a kind of, there's favor self-containedness seems to be a, a theme on the one hand, but on the other hand, 
we have a kind of conflicting theme, which is that to maximize the, your ability to reuse notes, we think that we'll reuse information. Our conclusion was that you cut it up into the smallest semantic units, and that gives you more flexibility for recombining those parts. And there's obviously a weird sort of slightly, um, those things are slightly in opposition to each other, but by putting your bundle of items into a self-contained bag, then you get back uh, that property. So now we're going to do, when was the last time there was a live demo at CodeMesh? But we're going to try um, something that's, well, it's worked about two times out of four, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good, that's a good, yeah. So. Yes, that's the picture. That's, uh, if it doesn't work, just, yes. just remember <laughs> this, yeah? Um, so I'm going to try and uh, change the display oh. so that we're not mirroring. Um, yeah, now I should be able to use this this system, which is doing so, oh very weird things. Can you keep talking, Jeremy? So um, Joe <laughs> had said to us, and I, I, I just jotted some things down. Joe said several times he tried to get Sam and I together. I've you had did, lots yeah. of interaction with Sam and Jerry, but Jeremy, but you two never seem to have met. I'm your greatest fan, so I'd love to see the TiddlyWiki sending messages to Sonic Pi. Personally, I think Sonic Pi and TiddlyWiki are soulmates. On the surface, they're different, but under the covers, they're very similar. Jeremy is combining fragments of knowledge through transclusion. Sam is making music by combining fragments of music represented in code. And he even told us exactly what he wanted us to do. He says, gluing together Sonic Pi and TiddlyWiki using OSC over UDP would be great fun. So, Jay, I'm very happy to say that that's what we've done. And uh, we obviously, we worked on this before we arrived at the conference, and then we've spent the last couple of days probably seeing us out there frantically trying to make Sam's ropey laptop Wi-Fi card work and everything. Um, and I think the experience that we've had is it's really been like, Joe's been here because he was the catalyst to get us together. Yeah, well, this should be your, yes. your can you show this, can you move this around? Hello, ah, this is good, so we're, yeah. that's test stage one. So we've got an iPad here doing an HDMI thing to a capture card to a USB thing to OBS to, on the screen. It's quite slightly blurry. So We're on commission for these dongles. And the dongles cost a lot of money, yeah, so. Thanks, Apple. Yeah, so, yeah, so this, is, this is tiddlywicky. So it was, for me, he, Joe kept saying, yeah, you need to absolutely hook up. And it, it was tragic that we had to wait till he passed away to actually give us the, the momentum to do it. I'm sure we would have done all together at some point very soon. Um, and Joe kept telling me about tiddlywicky and saying it'd be a great environment for you to put snippets of code for music in because you can put these small little chunks of it and you can store the history and you can see the relevance and you can keep all, the, all of them around just like you might want with notes but with sort of snippets of musical ideas. Uh, and so uh, he was always telling us to try and get them together to, to, to work together. So that's what we've absolutely done. So here is TiddlyWiki, and it contains some Sonic Pi code inside of it. And you've got, the, what's, what are these slider things here, Jeremy? Those are like, like MIDI knobs. They send um, integer messages that we can, okay, in fact, this top example is not bad. So you can see get OSC cutoff, that's, kind of like a named pipe, but oh, that's not really. Um, uh, so I'm sending down that pipe some numbers, and then this uh, Ruby code is picking those numbers out and then using them, as you can see, as parameters to a bit of synthesis. So if I play this, will it work? It might. Oh, yeah. yeah. So actually, if I switch to this screen. Oh. Uh, we've got Sonic Pi and TiddlyWiki there. Lovely. And I can run code in Sonic Pi over here. So I can, what is your, what are the OS messages you're sending? You're saying LAN. So I can create a live loop called Foo. I can uh, make this bigger. So I can read it. Synchronize it with LANs. Do a, a sample. Uh, let's run this code here. Um, Free pop grooves. Oh, beat stretch that by eight. Think for eight. And now, oh yeah. Could be louder now. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, 
that was that was a lovely thing to have done, and we, we're really excited to see where what we can do with this. But uh, I think for the rest of the time, maybe we we'll try and do something interesting musically. We, we've all had enough talking, haven't we? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Have you had enough talking? Yeah. Some of you. Like, you so had enough talking, can't even say yes. <laughs> um, and so what we try and do is try and uh, so Robert's standing there like needs to be doing something. So we've got a, uh, a lovely Moog synthesizer here. It's got lots of knobs. Can you play the knobs, yeah. Robert? Yes. The top <laughs> yeah. I'm playing the pencil. <laughs> top level. Yeah. So what we'll, let's. Uh, um, I'll just quickly write some code here before we do the tiddly wicked combination, just to get that going. So if I show you here, you can see for an eighth of a second, I can do a MIDI note of. Uh, what, notes, what notes are you doing? You're doing E's or C's? I am, on that one I'm doing E's, on this one I'm doing E's, yes. Yeah, so let's do sustain 0 0.1 and, and then that should be sending messages and it's absolutely not. Why is it not sending messages to the MIDI controller? Uh -huh. Is it turned on? It, it's not, yes, it's turned on, yes. Duk, 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 duk. And then... Uh, it's not. It's over MIDI. This one, uh, USB. So it should actually work. Oh, we're actually um, uh, hot spotting off of Sam's phone anyway. <laughs> uh, so I'm just resetting the MIDI. Um, we should see the Moog Seven come in that box up there in two seconds. One, two, and then I should be able to run this code, and it is not working. Oh, this is depressing. It's the demo. Good. Ah, do you know what's wrong? So Joe wrote. So. What happens here is that um, Sonic Pi uh, is written in Ruby. Never write a concurrent environment with mutable shared state in a, in a language like Ruby. It's a dead, terrible idea. Um, but uh, one, of the, um, one of the negatives is the fact that the garbage collector will kick in randomly and pause things and stuff. And so I wanted to write a... Uh, 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 so Ruby doesn't wor worry about doing things on time. It actually sends timestamps to something called SuperCollider, which is a synthesis, en synthesis engine which honors those timestamps. So ahead of time, say, in a half a second, can you play that note? <coughs> and SuperCollider operates on a really, really high priority uh, C++ thread, uh, and it will then honor that timestamp as best as it can. So I wanted to have the same idea for MIDI. I wanted to be able to send a, a, a message ahead of time, whilst I'm talking, I should be doing, resetting this, um, uh, for MIDI. And I, 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 couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine implementing something like that uh, with enough efficiency and low latency in C with my skills, don't have any of those skills, um, whereas I could imagine it writing it in Ruby. It would be really easy. You would basically listen on a socket, uh, uh, deconstruct the message, uh, look for the timestamp, and then, uh, of when it needed to happen, look at the current time, and then sleep for the difference in, an, in a separate thread, right? And then send the message on. Um, but obviously, you've got all these issues of Ruby. And so, I, 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 when I started learning about Erlang, I was like, well, oh, this probably would work. And Joe went, that's easy! And he wrote the code. And so, the, the code which is triggering this, this Moog synthesizer, which should be flashing now, but isn't still. Oh, that, I'm actually wrong. They go on, please. One and twos. Yeah, this light should be blooming and flashing, and it's not. It's not. And I don't know why. Uh, and, uh, but the Erlang process does die if you, um, if you sleep with the laptop and turn it on again. Yeah, but, but then it just restarts and it works again. Yeah, well, we haven't, uh, Joe's unfortunately not around to add that bit. <laughs> <laughs> it would be lovely. Yeah, you got Robert, he's the one of you. What the blooming hell is that? Oh, no. So, okay, I, I have no idea why I can't send. Can you, oh, this is why. I, we have a live lock. So I, my live loop is a thread. It's waiting for a message called lands. And there is no message called lands coming into the system. So let's not wait for that and run this. And it's still not working. Oh, yeah, it's working. Oh, yes, right. So now we're getting messages. I need to write live audio, Moog, and then, oh, yeah. There we are. There we are, Robert. Robert. <laughs> yeah. So you need to do something, don't you? So you, you probably want to. Um, I want to do that one. Yeah, just, just do it, do it. <laughs> oh, has it come through? Now, Tiddlywick is playing. This is great. And now, uh, I don't know how to write Ruby, but I'm going to randomly edit the Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So what should we do now? What should we do? Get some drums? Yeah, give it. Yeah, um, let's go for E bit beats, two beats stretch that by eight, up to four, six, for eight. Oh, uh, you seven. can feel free to move around. 
Yeah, yeah. Now we're going, we're going. Whoa, well done, Robert. Me. You pressed up. I oh, oh, no, I pressed play. <laughs> no, I pressed play. <laughs> I think I caused the syntax error. Sorry? I think I caused the syntax error. It's possible, it's possible, it's possible. It's possible. I think that's good though. That's sufficiently worked enough. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that we're, we're excited about where we can go with this. We've got a new band now. Yeah. So uh, you can hire us to perform at your festivals and uh, parties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're not cheap though. Um, <laughs> No, but yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with both of you, absolutely. It's and, uh, been really fun. Do you want to bring those last couple of slides up? Yeah, of course. Um, the, um, uh, Sam and I both um, were supporting ourselves as indie developers running these open source projects. And uh, so we wanted to just draw your attention. Well, I'm going to draw your attention to the fact that you can support Sonic Pi via Sam's Patreon, which is a way that you can subscribe a certain amount of money per month and be confident that you're supporting him and giving him the runway that he needs to continue his work. That's very kind of you. Thank you. And I say, do not support Jeremy. No, <laughs> absolutely. Now, I think Jeremy's work is super interesting. And uh, the fact that he's working on uh, an environment which has like weird worlds of small talk where the, the environment is itself, it's self-hosted, which I think is a really exciting world where we, in this world where everything is on the server, that's not always the best thing for many, many, many reasons. So having an, an environment which is actually locally on your machine, which acts like it's on the server, is exciting. And the ability to put all your notes in it and to share your notes and to work with them together and to see the history of those things and put sliders in your notes, you know? And then use your notes to send messages to a music system. And it only took him a few hours, actually, uh, to actually make that stuff work nicely. So I think, that's, that, I think the potential of that is really exciting. So Jeremy is absolutely somebody you would want to support if you have any uh, ability to do that. Thank you very much, yeah. Sam. We should impersonate each other more often. It's incredibly <laughs> effective, isn't it? Okay, I'll try to be um, taller. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. And then I think we... Uh, we... Wait, we're not showing that. Oh, we're not showing that. Oh, that's why. <laughs> We were sure. Oh, that's a good, good, good call. Oh, yeah, no, of course. Uh, so, I've not done the, the split screen thing, so I'm going to go to the display and go. So, so sorry. So, the slides that you didn't see then had the link to, to Sam's Patreon and the link to my company through which you can hire me for consultancy work if you wanted to. Now we're up. Now, now we're up. So, Sports by, by, by Patreon, and if you wish to support TillyWiki by hiring me. And, uh, and of course, you can support Robert by using Erlang. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I think I've got the one, the mic here. This might work as well. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think. Okay. Um, no, thank you for this. I think the best way of honoring Joe is being a bit like him, being kind of inquisitive, sharing and inspiring others, which in a way is also very much what this conference is about. So this is ad hoc good. and last minute. Ad hoc. <laughs> well, conference driven development, yes, but we shouldn't be telling all that in these. Well, we, what do you mean? We had a week. <laughs> <laughs> it worked, though, it worked. Yes, I know. And I could twiddle the, the dials yeah, as well, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pleased about that. Yeah. Please. So am I. Yeah. So they're looking for volunteers, especially Sam for the Sonic Pi. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone wants to get involved for any reason, like if you want to hack on, on the software, yeah. if you want to help me build resources for educators and teachers, if you're a musician and you want to make a cool track, if you're friends with Taylor Swift. <laughs> I think that if someone like Taylor made a track of music with code, it would, it would change the world overnight. Uh, and so if you've got any friends who are, uh, are well-known musicians who would like to try and help us to engage and, and, and work with the next generation of... Like, don't, like, uh, Simon's talk was great the other day. 
but I don't believe that sorting algorithms are the way to engage the next generation of coders, especially if you want to find people who are not like us. Right? If you want to find more like us, sorting algorithms, if you don't, I think music actually is a great way of doing that. Yeah.